Ok. Hello. <laughs> ok, we are again here to continue with our discussion. Actually, um, just before the, the coffee break, um, I was telling you that um, after being uh, looking uh, thoroughly uh, through the, the work of Wohan Klaus Schur today as a uh, perfect example of, of uh, the use of different strategies to get the sustainability and in this kind of uh, social practice or um, specifically in the art util practice um, we wanted to, to ask some questions um, to keep it in mind and um, I just uh, went to the, to the lab that uh, happened uh, this year in New York uh, in the Queens, Queens Museum of New York, uh, we start um, one of the first steps of the project, the Museum of Arte Util, was uh, in fact to develop this lab uh, there, uh, where we start to think about the Arte Util and, and about their uh, special characteristics. And um, uh, we did uh, uh, in this lab where uh, uh, different artists were invited from our archive and from the open call that we develop and um, basically there were uh, uh, group discussions and uh, some artists uh, went there to present their, their works and to, to talk about their experience and um, uh, there were um, mainly four uh, discussions and four different issues to discuss and um, we call it like uh, the hypothesis of analysis of art util and um, I would like to, to propose you to think about uh, specifically one that is uh, the one that I was uh, mentioning before the break that is about um, thinking the, the project as an ecosystem so uh, completely uh, making this connection with these ideas that we have been working yesterday and today about uh, the strategies, uh, the possibilities to develop the projects and the different um, ways to, to get the, to reach the objectives and uh, the different ways to, to build a structure and to, to establish a network that keeps, uh, that could give the project a long life after even when the artist is, is gone and um, the project can, can be uh, followed by the by the participants or the users. So uh, I, will, I am now repeating the questions, just in case you <laughs> wasn't here at the beginning. So uh, the questions uh, is uh, mainly that there wasn't the same questions that were work in New York. So it's uh, first is what are the different expectations of Arte Util when it works as a proposition, a prototype, or a fully implemented project. And this is about um, what we were talking yesterday about the possibility of, of when you develop this kind of project that sometimes um, it never happens, the project never happens. So it's what we call like a proposition because uh, sometimes, especially in the, in the historical examples uh, that we have in our archive of Arte Util, uh, a lot of artists started to think about this kind of practice, but they couldn't uh, manage to develop the project because even the context or even the situation, the political situation or, or um, economic situations that, uh, that, in, that uh, stop their develop. But then there we have this kind of, of this typology or, or uh, classification that we did about the projects that, for example, uh, were done, but uh, in fact the society didn't, didn't get the project by itself, so it, it became at the end a kind of prototype, because the artist developed the project, but it just happened once, or it just happened that, that they just did the object that it should be used by the people, but at the end that uh, didn't happen. So is what we call prototype and uh, at the end of course the full implemented is the projects that already have been done and um, mainly are, are, are being taken by, by the society. So question, what are the different expectations when we are starting to, to think about these projects? And uh, when should the project end? 
that is important. And when and how should an artist initiate or leave? And uh, how does one choose? Develop and maintain partnerships across, uh, across sectors. So that is uh, mainly about uh, the sustainability of the project itself. When the artist starts the project uh, of Arte Util or a social practice um, related project, that uh, in fact um, is something that for the artist uh, it should have an, an end. And uh, at a certain point, the project uh, beca becomes part of the, of the real, I mean, the people that is collaborating with this artist and uh, the users of the project could follow the project without the artist. So the artist has to decide, and I think that is important to, to be clear uh, from the very beginning, that the artist has to decide when, when uh, it's ready, when the project is ready to, to stop as an art project. Um, um, maybe transform in a real thing, or maybe still keeps us, us on our projects, but without his supervision, no? So, and in that way, uh, as we have been seeing a lot this morning in relation with Wuhan Closure, um, one of the, the better uh, ways is to choose a good network of partnerships of people, inter, uh, interdisciplinary, a group of people that is willing to, to keep the project alive, no? So that's important. And um, how do artists initiators work with or against institutions? And this is, uh, again, uh, thinking about the position of Arte Util as an uh, institutional critique. As, uh, as we were telling yesterday, if uh, it's uh, okay with the maker um, and uh, um, opposition statement, against an institution, or maybe it's better to think in a kind of a, of a repurpose of that, in, that institution. So you don't put it yourself in front of the institutions, but you uh, instead decide to use the institution in a different way. Or other question is, how are projects found, funded and sustained? sustained? And, uh, to what extent is this central to the project's conception and ideology? So, and that is mainly about, uh, again, about the sustainability of the project, but uh, even about um, the core of the ideology on the, the, um, the, let's say, the character of the project itself. Because um, when you are beginning, you have to, to manage to find the funding to, to develop the project. And uh, sometimes, uh, in fact, you have to go to the real and you have to collaborate with companies or with uh, institutions that uh, probably in their own ideology have a different statements that you have. So you have to deal with that at the very beginning. So to be really sure that you are um, following um, or you are both in the same page or maybe uh, you can manage to, to repurpose that institution or at least to be aware that is uh, something that you are doing um, on purpose. You, you have to be aware about uh, uh, yeah, what is the, the funding and what is the um, possibilities that you have and uh, if you have to, to manage to find this uh, kind of funding. And uh, the last question is, uh, how is a scale determined and evaluated? So how do you, when the project is developed, how do you, do you measure the scale of the project and uh, the impact? And uh, how important is the impact or not? Or is just uh, for you important the process itself or the reaction of the specific participants? that uh, have been directly connected with the project from the beginning, or, or you are more uh, focused on the reaction of the people that is um, getting in contact with the project through the news or through the media, or, I mean, something that you have to, to, to maybe think about it even before to start the project. How is going to be your own evaluation of the project and the impact that it, it has? And... Uh, in relation with these questions, 
we have uh, again we we want to talk about the project that uh, one of the projects that we mentioned yesterday that is the Robin Ju rolling jubilee that happened in the 2012 in new york went uh, uh, started by the group uh, uh, strike Dep that was part of the occupy, occupy wall street uh, movement and uh, in fact um, just for the ones that were not uh, here yesterday, I uh, told you that uh, what uh, this project is about, uh, the DEP, and it's about um, following the name as uh, Jubilee, it means um, in different cultures, an event that uh, when, when the DEPs were cancelled. Uh, so a kind of, 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 of goodness, I don't know how to define, but the moment when the, all the debts are can, uh, were cancelled. So what they propose is with the, the actual situation and the economical situation is that uh, Strike Debt is a group formed by different professionals and uh, from many different fields and they decide to, to use the, the strategy that is already used by the economical system itself, that is that uh, in the banks could, uh, could buy the debt uh, mm, really cheap, in a really cheap rates. So uh, that's something that is already happening a lot in the economical system, but the normal uh, people, let's say, uh, we don't know about that system, so we, we neither can think about it. So they propose, strike the propose to, to buy mm, this debt. So it's like, um, and the difference is like um, with this um, system you can buy uh, one dollar of debt for pennies. <laughs> so it's really cheap. <laughs> and uh, what they did is that uh, they organized this campaign to, to get funding to, to, to engage everyone who wanted, who was willing to participate to, to donate uh, money to buy a public debt. And uh, this debt was not uh, nominal, so you never would know um, for, for whom it is. So you are really uh, cancel the debts of people that you, you don't know. And they did it, and it's still uh, working. And um, so it's something that you still, if you want, you can collaborate. And um, I want to show you um, specifically about this project. We have um, a video that actually uh, it was part of our la of the lab in New York. That is um, the presentation that uh, Jim Constanzo part of this movement uh, he did in the lab in New York about this project in concrete and thinking about this hypothesis, these questions that I, I, I asked before uh, about the ecosystem management of the projects. So let me... Okay, here we go. The occupation, whoops, jumped a little quickly. Uh, the occupation only lasted really a few months and toward the end it became Wait, really because we're going to see the image. So something uh, is going wrong. People came, but it was really an amazing space oh, at the yes. beginning. And um, there was a lot of mythology built around it. Uh, the fact okay. of the matter is, like in the first week, that we tried to put together a one-page statement for the press about why we were there. And we had like four or five working groups out there trying to figure different things out. And we came up with nothing. And uh, so that was kind of, I understood it to be, that was the ride we were going to take. And of course, I don't speak for Occupy. I don't really even speak for Strike Debt. Nobody does. Everybody does. who has been part of it. Um, and it was like this incredible different mixture of people, you know, with, you know, Jesus is not for corporate greed was... Um, I put it there because it's not really what most people think about Occupy. But we have this huge Occupy faith with many churches, and a lot of that was really important for Occupy Sandy and creating spaces where we can help give relief to different parts of the city. Um, I was also involved with uh, Occupy Museums, 
And I just want to bring that up because we were helping the um, art handlers, who, the art handlers who were also part uh, of the, not the AFL-CI, they were Teamsters Union. So they were being locked out of their jobs. And we went to uh, MoMA, we went to Sotheby's, they have an interlocking board. And MoMA actually sells paintings from their collection through Sotheby's. Um, it's, it is what it is. Uh, we, we brought a lot of attention to the, the fact the union, different union organizers really liked what we were doing. And what happened was, I, I actually teach art and um, I, I've been very upset about the fact the prices, or the, let's say the uh, amount of debt students have been going through over the last 10 years. It's, it's, it's shocking, actually. And so I became part of the student uh, debt movement. We had our T1 day in March of last year, and you can see one person has, we asked people to put the amount of debt around their neck. Uh, the older gentleman has, uh, said, 184. That's amazing amount of debt. I mean, $55,000 for somebody that year in this economy is not going to be paid off. Um, and so we came from that. Uh, Occupy Museums went to the Berlin Biennial while we were gone. There was all these activities happening. We were meeting a lot of different people from different Occupy movements around the world. And the, uh, talking about debt and other things. Uh, but when we returned, I got an email from uh, Student Debt. They said, well, we found this new group and we're going to be meeting over the summer to talk about what debt was. And this was really the beginning of strike debt. Uh, you might recognize on the upper left is David Graeber and Andrew Roth, Ross. And uh, we just were meeting in the park, having, a, you know, these kind of casual, uh, uh, just conversations. We had different people presenting, what we were trying to explore what the idea of debt was, and what kinds of debt there were. And uh, so we decided to really push the idea of a jubilee, the idea of this, these, the debt that has most people are involved with. It's either manipulated by either government programs or uh, an economic crash that was actually a criminal activity in many people's mind. And we felt that that was like something that we could really resonate, that would really resonate among people. And we actually became an offshoot of Occupy because we took a different stance. We said we want to engage on this. We were not going to just kind of say the system is broken. And then there was a lot of people within Occupy who don't want to take political stances because it would limit what you, what you could really accomplish. They felt they wanted to go after the whole system. And if we said, well, let's get rid of, well, let's take pol uh, money out of politics, that would be a step in a good direction. But you know, that first week we couldn't even agree on that. But um, when we started talking about what debt was and all the different kinds of debt, we felt that we were going to take that stand. We were going to call for a jubilee. Um, and what happened was the first year anniversary, we called it S17 Day, and all the different Occupy groups, even though um, we had very little vis visibility since the fall, since we were evicted, we got together, did a series of demonstrations. You'll see the map at the bottom. We went down to Wall Street with a really strategic plan, and uh, you know there were a lot of rest. There were a lot of uh, also just different independent actions that were going on there. But we really, what we did was we launched the draw. Um, what the upper left hand corner? Some of you might know Yates McGee. He was uh, arrested inside. This was uh, Chase Manhattan Bank. We went inside of different banks doing actions. Uh, but what, when we, we also, what we did, we pr uh, produced and independently published the Debt Resisters Operation Manual. And um, one of the, I also put title in there too because Occupy Theory was a part of the student debt movement that formed the new group. And uh, there's, you know, the Strike Debt, we have a website of course. Uh, you can download the Debt Resisters Manual for free. We have been approached by a publisher, uh, a very sympathetic publisher. We're going to do a, a regular um, commercial publication that will be in malls and also be an e-book. Uh, but you'll always be able to download both the old and new manuals. So it'll always, always be open for, you know, for people to download. Um, one of the things about um, the strike deck that we decided to do in the relationship to the Jubilee was create what we call the Rolling Jubilee. And the Rolling Jubilee was always 
a meme, a way of letting people understand how did that process work, and also to, to show the, you know, not only how it worked, but how corrupt it was. Uh, when, what, what we did was we had uh, a lot of people talking about what these relationships are, but we found out that we could buy bad debt from um, vulture capitalists. So basically, if you're a bank or a company, you can declare um, a certain amount of debt that, that isn't being paid back as a loss and write it off your taxes. Then you can also go out and sell it to vulture capitalists for pennies on the dollar. And they harass people and really make, it makes life very difficult if you're constantly bombard, bombarded by telephone calls. Um, they send letters with misleading information. And it's very stressful if you, if you have ever known anybody that's been in that situation. So we decided we would raise money and just abolish the debt. No strings attached. Uh, we, were, we did a telephone and we were hoping to raise, oops, we were hoping to raise $10,000, which would like get us like $100,000 worth of debt. Well, the telethon gave us over $60,000, $70,000. And now we're up to $500,000, which is, we'll be able to buy $11 million worth of debt. It sounds like a lot of debt, but the amount of debt that we have in this, well, just this country, is over, it's trillions of dollars. So this is absolutely nothing. But again, it is a, it is a tool to bring people's attention to how the system works. Um, we also did um, a report on Sandy, and uh, the report is who, who is shouldering the cost, and we found out that FEMA really gives people loans to rebuild, so they're not really giving them any kind of, that all the money that you read about, historically, uh, with, with her, uh, Hurricane um, Katrina, most of that money went to Halliburton and other large corporations who took, took the original grant money, then started subcontracting. So they took their 10, 15 percent, then kept subcontracting to different other organizations. And so we did a report about that. We were talking about how people were affected in different parts of New York City who were affected by Sandy and how the treatment was unequal. And we were surprised to find how close it was to Katrina. We did, you know, in my mind, I didn't think that they could get away with what they did in, in the Gulf Coast here in New York because of the media and everything. But there really, really isn't that much difference in what's going on. The person who was Bloomberg appointed to put in charge of rebuilding is uh, a vice president of uh, Goldman Sachs. So these kind of ideas of where the money goes, what that money is about, when you read about all that amount of money, it's, it's uh, very misleading. Uh, I'm going to jump into here. This is uh, the second edition of the draw. We, we're covering a lot of different things like credit scores, credit cards. Uh, medical debt is the first debt that we bought, um, and it's a strategic thing. Most people understand uh, how, med how medical debt is really unfair, because even if you have health insurance, that does not mean you will be covered. There are, well, it depends on what your insurance is, right? So you can get up to a certain amount of coverage, and then you can say, well, that's it, you're going to be dropped at this point. Uh, and also, if you're not covered, you can't afford insurance. So there's all these different levels. We decided to go with uh, medical debt first. But we will be getting into other kinds of debt, even including uh, credit card. But the drama is really trying to break down how the systems work. And if you want to call it neoliberalism, if you want to call it capitalism, it is a system that is really based on debt. And when you look at national debt, especially when you look at what's happening in Europe, when you look at the austerity programs uh, that are being forced on people and you realize that it's a combination of deregulation and fraud by uh, the government working with Wall Street and other corporations, uh, it's, it's, we're, we're in a fiction, fictional economic situation right now if you think about it. Nobody knows how much the banks are worth because they're derivatives. Nobody can actually put a price on derivatives. No, was it four years after the crash? It's still unknown. Uh, so we're trying to deal with these things. This is from the telethon. Uh, in the middle, well, on the left, uh, with, a, with a big smile on his face, is Tom Loki. He did a lot of work for this. All three of them, that's Winter, Laura. And there's all these different people uh, that have been involved in this. This is not, this is really a collective process. 
there is no one person that really owns it. Everybody, you know, we're arguing things out. Even when we're going through the right to draw, we're still having discussions and, you know, trying to figure out different ways of, of presenting this kind of information. Um, I was also, I'm also involved with uh, making worlds a forum on the commons. I don't want to talk about it too much, but we're also having a dialogue between strike debt and making worlds, talking about what other kind of system, what would post-capitalism look like? And there's been actually a lot of literature written about that. Uh, you know, I also started something called the Aaron Burr Society. Of course, he shot and killed Hamilton, who's the great American uh, capitalist, our first capitalist. Uh, and it was kind of an absurd start project. But the idea is that the research that I did actually uh, brought me to uh, the Union for Radical Political Economists, who have a journal, they're all academics. Uh, the Public Banking uh, Institute has a, they're more policy makers. So these different ideas about what economies are, how they function, the idea of that this is a false economy. There, it, it's not just from Occupy Wall Street. There are many different, um, different people involved, uh, many different organizations. I mean, if you just go to the website, Google, you'll find hundreds of books. Uh, the background that took me to here, the upper, left, upper right is uh, repo history, and I put that sign in front of Wall Street in 1992 that talks about that. It talks about deregulation and fraud, and uh, it goes back to the 1890s and talks about the 1929 crash and other uh, instances of, the, of this happening, which was also the Saving and Loan so uh, Association. There's a uh, William Black wrote a book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Okay, he is a lawyer, he's an economist with a PhD in economics. He is also a former bank regulator. He was a very obscure um, academic. After the, you know, after the 2008 crash, he became incredibly popular because the exact same things that he writes about here happened in the 2008 crash. Uh, this is the thing that we are trying to say, in addition to what debt is about, in addition to the Jubilee, the idea of austerity is based on a lie. Uh, the New York Times just wrote, we're living in the golden age of corporate profits, and we also have 20 to 30 trillion dollars sitting in offshore accounts, not paying taxes, not being reinvested in our economy. Okay? That is more than the gross national product, all the economic activities, in both New York, uh, I'm sorry, both in uh, the USA and Japan. It's a huge amount of money. The idea of who we are, what capitalism, what our economic system is, um, is really under question. And people within, not only with Occupy, when I go around and I do these uh, performances and spend that stamp money, people working in bodegos get it. At first it was a little obscure. Uh, but, you know, people are beginning to understand we cannot afford a system that only cares about profits. We have to have a system that cares about humans, workers. We have to have a system that cares about the environment. Our current economic and political system will not do that. Well... I think that is pretty clear <laughs> uh, that Jim Constanzo explained that uh, I have to say to tell you that if you want to see um, all the the conversations that were developed in the lab, you can go directly to the website that we talked that this video this video from the website artutil.net and um, yeah, I just wanted to just uh, before to finish because we are almost on time. I just wanted to to point it out that um, uh, the importance in the in the strike debt itself uh, in this project, I think that is uh, to think about uh, that uh, it's coming. It's a project that is not coming directly from the art world. I mean, the, this Jean Constanzo, for example, is an artist, but uh, there were a lot of different professionals implicated uh, in the collective, and um, as we. Uh, were asking before, they really uh, were uh, 
from the very beginning aware of the um, this kind of, of uh, collaboration and which which kind of institutions they wanted to implicate in the process so uh, they will keep their their um, ideology let's say he just mentioned about the publish the publishers that they ask to uh, to 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 collaborate with the book but apart they still keep the these uh, manuals in the website so you can download it for free so they are really keeping their their uh, character and uh, the collaborations that they had they have with the museums and apart um, this idea to to create from the very beginning a collective process so a network of people that uh, is coming from very different organizations and with very different backgrounds to keep the project alive no i think that this uh, really interesting to to see it in that way and um, I don't know if you have questions, but I don't have more time to <laughs> be here. <laughs> so please, um, if you have more questions, you can already uh, go to the website and to write whatever you want, your opinions or whatever. That's Facebook true. page. That's true. That's true. And you actually, can call us. Yeah, you can send can email. Us, exactly. <laughs> and if you have more. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you feel that you would like to see more and you know more about Arte Util. Remember that uh, the exhibition is coming, it's, it's happening and uh, now, now, yes, actually, in December, 7th of December is the opening and uh, it will be there until the 30th of March 2014. So you have uh, still time to get your tickets and to go to Eindhoven and see this exhibition that is going to be great. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Hem. I think that uh, for us it was uh, a great way to start uh, our, uh, our laboratorio because uh, it was extremely inspiring uh, to like, open this uh, session, uh, this cycle of uh, uh, meetings and lessons uh, through this idea of art as a tool as a tool that, that can be implemented in society, so not, not only art uh, as representation uh, or, or as a production of objects that eventually could be placed uh, in a market or in a museum, uh, but art as a transformative power. Uh, a transformative power that can have a real uh, impact on, uh, on society and that can uh, really let us uh, uh, imagine and uh, experience uh, uh, different uh, way of, uh, ways of, of living. And also thank you for introducing so clearly the idea of sustainability uh, and uh, to introduce also this idea of sustainable relationships which to me are the, the, the very uh, basic uh, uh, elements uh, in order to create uh, economically sustainable uh, uh, projects. So thank you for all these in inspiring uh, hints. Uh, we will keep them with us during the next uh, days, uh, during the next, les next lessons. And good luck with uh, the project. And say hello to all the great uh, Arte Util team. <laughs> OK, thank, thank you. you very much. Eh, torniamo con Claudia Ballocchini alle 2, parliamo di, di fundraising, quindi vi aspettiamo.